everyone to today's uh, webinar, Best Myeloma Management in this Era of COVID-19. Uh, very pleased that so many uh, patients and caregivers and supporters are able to join today. Uh, very happy that uh, three uh, experts have uh, set aside time on this Saturday to join us and give us the, uh, the benefit of their knowledge. Uh, Dr. Rafat Abinar from uh, Indiana University. So welcome, Rafat. Kevin uh, Briggle uh, from Massey Cancer Center in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, Dr. Nupur Raji from Mass General in Boston, Massachusetts. So thanks uh, to them for, uh, for joining us today. We are very pleased to have the support of our sponsors, uh, Amgen, Binding Site, Bluebird, Bristol-Myers Squibb, GSK, Genentech, Janssen, Oncopeptides, Takeda, and Sanofi uh, Genzyme. Welcome uh, to, the, to the program here. Um, this is the uh, summary of the agenda. I'll show you the, the agenda, which is broken into two parts. Uh, uh, first of all, there is this uh, welcome, which I'm doing right now, followed by a 101, and then uh, uh, life is a canvas uh, looking at the different side effects and symptom management uh, with, with Kevin Briggle. And then uh, what has become a, a very important topic is uh, COVID-19. And so I just want to let everyone know uh, that we will uh, uh, move forward so that we have plenty of time for uh, the panel discussion uh, about COVID-19, particularly uh, the new information about uh, the third booster shot, which was just approved by both the FDA and uh, the CDC. And so we will be able to discuss the details of those recommendations and try to answer uh, questions that you might have. And then we'll take a short break. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll come back and uh, uh, very excited to hear an update from uh, Dr. Raj about uh, the immune therapies and uh, from uh, Dr. Abinar about uh, what are the uh, uh, currently approved approaches to relapse uh, management. And again, uh, we will have uh, uh, plenty of time for uh, discussion. So uh, this first uh, 101 session is intended just to give uh, a broad background with some updates uh, uh, for everyone, uh, uh, looking at everything from uh, initial diagnosis, uh, testing, uh, initial therapy, and uh, general expectations uh, for the my myeloma management in uh, uh, 2021. Some key points just for everyone uh, to, to be aware of is, is that when a patient uh, is first diagnosed or aware of, of myeloma, uh, it is a treatable condition and over 90% of patients will respond uh, to initial current therapies. And so this is really uh, the very good news. And with, with the new therapies, the, the average first remission for uh, most patients will be four years or, or even longer, as you'll see in, in data that uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, and in 2021, the average survival has extended out beyond seven years out to 10 years, and some patients can uh, even be living out into the 15 and 20 plus year category. And so, although we, we, we will talk about it, uh, we're not able to uh, uh, recommend a therapy that will cure myeloma, certainly we are expecting uh, these kinds of uh, initial uh, results. And new therapies are constantly improving uh, the outlook. So to get those best results, uh, expert consultation really does help. And I think that we all recommend to get, uh, if you can, uh, at some point, type of expert consultation initially to make sure that you're on a good path forward. And so that uh, expert can be available these days through a virtual consult, which have become much more available and accessible. And so I would encourage all patients to seek that out. It doesn't mean that you need to give up your doctor, but you can get uh, some expert input and make sure, it, particularly initially, 
that your initial choices in therapy and other uh, supportive elements are, are good. And uh, th this, this can really have a, a joint plan uh, with you and your, your local doctor or doctors, your, your uh, myeloma expert, and maybe your, even your GP, uh, along with an outside uh, uh, expert. And uh, you see that we provide a link here uh, of questions that you can be ready to ask your doctor, the sorts of things where you really do need to have some answers to help understand the disease, which is a complicated disease, and, and uh, some of the details of expectations about the treatment. Uh, how, quick, how quickly will you respond to treatment? Uh, uh, how will we know if you're responding to treatment? Some of these key initial questions that so many patients have. And so, uh, increasingly, we get questions <clears throat> from patients who have smoldering myeloma because indicators of an abnormal uh, myeloma protein are often picked up uh, much sooner than they often were in the past. And we have been looking at indicators uh, that will indicate whether or not a patient with early disease, either just a, a monoclonal protein discovered in the blood or with some other features, uh, actually have some kind of what we call a smoldering myeloma, uh, which could progress into myeloma at some point. And so the question is, what are the tests that can help determine, is a patient likely to be on that path for some progression? And in general, we've been looking at that uh, risk of progression within 18 months to two years. And so we have been working on a new SMM, smoldering myeloma risk scoring tool. And the three tests which turn out, uh, right now at least, to be the most helpful are the, the, the two 2020 model, which is uh, two is the level of the serum myeloma protein in the blood. So two grams per deciliter. 20 is the free light ratio and then 20 is also the percentage of plasma cells in, in the bone marrow. Uh, patients who reach a combination of those levels are the ones who are at uh, the highest risk uh, of progressing within 18 months to two years. Uh, in the scoring tool, uh, we've broken it down into uh, different levels. You can see there's not just a single break-off point. We've broken it down into three or four different categories for each of those uh, factors, the free light, the serum protein, and the bone marrows, and then you can come up with a score. And I'd like to emphasize uh, three things about the scoring. First of all, we have that low risk group. And so if the numbers are low, the risk of progression is really very, very low, even out to five years or beyond. Uh, and so this is very, very reassuring if the numbers are in those lower categories. And then in the higher risk group, you can see, if you look at the bottom, uh, some of the higher numbers for scoring fall into the bone marrow plasma cell percentage. And so one of the biggest factors which indicates uh, a possibility of spreading uh, an and active disease is if the, if the bone marrow plasma cells are increasing from 20% to 30% to 40% or higher, and this, this confers a higher risk. Uh, And so, so when should treatment be started? Uh, and so obviously for myeloma patients, um, if you have uh, the CRAB features, which I'll show in just a moment, uh, uh, then, then there is active myeloma. If there are uh, none of these features, then this is where it falls into these uh, smoldering categories uh, where we need to think about, do we want to observe or treat in some fashion? And so uh, for the low risk group, observation monitoring, definitely recommended. In the intermediate group, uh, one certainly can consider therapy and there are options of trials uh, and then simple things that could be either uh, two drugs like Revlimid and Dexamethasone or Velcade Revlimid or Dex or even something um, uh, in, in a trial setting that could include even four drugs. Next slide. 
But really, uh, one of the main things that we're looking at right now is what we call the ultra high risk, where the score is uh, uh, 12 or, or, or higher. And in this group, uh, there's a definite risk of progression. And so we uh, are thinking that th this kind of a patient should uh, at least see, receive something uh, simple like Revlimid or maybe even something like a, 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 a three drug combination. To be uh, looking at the uh, uh, diagnosis in this way, you need to have these baseline tests. So obviously in myeloma, uh, the bone marrow indicates the percent of the myeloma. And as you just saw, the percentage of the plasma cells uh, has a big impact in assessing the uh, amount of the disease and whether it's likely to progress in the coming months. Uh, but we also need to have an indication of in your case, what is the tendency for the myeloma to cause damage to the bones? And this varies a lot from patient to patient, where those plasma cells, in some cases, have a strong tendency to damage the bone. And in this x-ray here, you can see the tiny black areas in the arm of a patient and in the bones, the radius and ulna bones there. And those are areas where the myeloma has triggered some areas of damage that we call uh, focal lesions, lesions of the bone, areas of damage. The uh, myeloma is in the middle part of the bone, which is kind of like a tube. And then as it's growing outwards, it uh, damages uh, the area around uh, the, uh, the outside of the tube, so to speak. Next slide. And so uh, if we're looking at uh, the diagnosis of myeloma, uh, the criteria that we use or the CRAB criteria, uh, which include if the blood calcium is elevated, if there's kidney problems, uh, the, the, the uh, creatinine, if there's anemia, and if there are any of those bone lesions that I was just showing you. And then uh, uh, for the, um, uh, the, the, the new cr criteria where you may or may not have symptoms, uh, we look at the percentage of plasma cells by itself, and 60% is, is highly linked uh, to uh, early active disease, as does a, a free light ratio of 100 or better. And if you do have uh, 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 more than one uh, lesion on, on some type of imaging. Next slide. The, the two additional types of tests that are the most helpful, and many patients will have uh, seen or been given results of these tests, uh, one of them is the chromosome tests, which is evaluated using FISH testing. This is a testing which has to be done on the bone marrow sample. So at the time when the bone marrow sample is taken, uh, it needs to be sent off to the lab and tested with a fluorescent in situ hybridization, a fluorescent color test where um, the pathologist can look and see if the colors are mixed up, which tells if there have been uh, changes in the chromosomes where pieces have been added or parts have been lost or moved around. And uh, this can indicate whether the myeloma is a standard risk or maybe at a higher risk of uh, early uh, relapse. We then look more closely at the bones uh, beyond x-rays using uh, MRI or uh, PET scanning. And uh, uh, clearly, these are much more sensitive, and they will show lesions which have not shown up on uh, x-ray. Uh, although the standard testing for uh, myeloma these days is not just the regular x-rays, but uh, whole body low-dose CT. And if this can be done up front, this is uh, particularly helpful to document or assess the amount of uh, bone damage. Next slide. And so just broadly, uh, the major components of the, of the treatment uh, are linked to the age of the patient and the general health of the patient and any other uh, complications the patient might have. Uh, the initial therapy is often the same or very similar uh, for older patients uh, uh, or patients who are not able to undergo autologous stem cell transplant, after initial therapy, there is uh, consolidation and maintenance. Uh, 
And uh, if a transplant, an autologous stem cell transplant is uh, discussed and planned, this can be done after four to six cycles of therapy and then uh, maintenance therapy after that. A very, very nice uh, source of an update uh, is an annual update that is provided by uh, Dr. Vincent Rajkumar. Uh, we pr provide a link here to Vincent's most recent overall update for uh, diagnosis and initial management, which is, I think, quite helpful. Next slide. I think the, the, the fantastically uh, good news uh, for, for myeloma patients is that uh, uh, in the the little bit at the bottom of the slide, uh, you'll see the, the old therapies that you, we used to have, but then starting uh, uh, in 1999, 2001, 2002, we started to have the availability uh, of the new therapies, the, the IMIDs, uh, thalidomide, revlimid, and pomalidomide, the proteasome inhibitors, uh, uh, Velcade, uh, followed by uh, carfilzomib, and then ixazomib. And then uh, all of the new immune therapies and other novel therapies over in the relapsed or rec rescue sec section. Uh, and we have so many of those now, the most recently approved being the amalflufin, uh, the belantomab, the selenexor. Uh, and so uh, many, many options, which is very helpful uh, if the disease has relapsed or is not coming under control. Uh, the standard of care, uh, at least uh, using uh, three drugs, uh, continues to be the, the VRD, uh, which is based largely on the SWOG trial, uh, which compared the three drugs, Velcade, Revlimid, and Dex, uh, Bortezomib, Lenalidomide, and Dex, versus Revlimid, and Dex, Lenalidomide, and Dex. Uh, next slide. And so the, the main thing here is uh, that uh, there is a, a basic level of response and survival that we can now expect using just this type of a three-drug regimen. Uh, and so the, the first remission is between three and four years. And the overall survival has improved so that over half of the patients are, are continuing uh, to do well at seven years. And the other thing that you can see here is that the red curve is the VRD, but you can see that the uh, doublet, the Revlimid and Dex, those patients are also doing uh, really quite well. And so an elderly patient or a more fragile patient can also do quite well uh, if, if they are taking a doublet, if that happens to be what is feasible. Next slide. And so... What does that mean that patients can expect these days in 2021? Well, uh, using a triplet or uh, adding in and maybe even a quadruplet, if we add in uh, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, uh, such as uh, daratumumab or ezetuximab, we can have a deep response in the vast majority of patients. And then that first response can be in the four-year range and as I'll show you in a moment, uh, even in uh, out to five-year range. And then we have the option uh, to come in early. And that second response, if you come in early, can also be a significant and substantial response. And before you know it, a patient can be out in that five to 10-year level and beyond. And so it really is amazing that we can have these expectations for treatment uh, in 2021, which are so different than they were uh, 20 years ago. Next slide. And so right now, when we start out, we're looking at that VRD triple therapy, which can be enhanced to make it a quadruplet by adding uh, daratumumab, for example. And then the big option is whether we should um, uh, conduct an autologous stem cell transplant. And this has become much more of a discussion point because uh, early autologous stem cell transplant clearly improves the length of the first remission. However, uh, the data are not there yet to show that that really impacts the ultimate overall survival. Uh, we still recommend using bone therapy for all, all patients, uh, uh, 
uh, either Zomeda or Iridia, or the newer agent uh, Danusumab, uh, uh, which is uh, obviously much more convenient and uh, equally active. Next slide. I just want to draw attention to something uh, that happened uh, this year at the European Hematology Association meeting, uh, virtual, where Terry Facon from France presented the results with the three drug combination rather than using Velcade, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone in the frontline setting for transplant ineligible patients. Uh, he had a study using daratumumab, the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody combined with lenalidomide and DEX. And these results in this Maya trial have been really amazingly good. Next slide. Yeah. And so this shows you what we call the progression-free survival or the length of remission uh, with the three-drug combination dara rev -dex, versus just the rev -dex. And you can see that at 60 months, five years, where that dotted line comes down, 52.5% uh, of the patients are still in remission. Uh, and so really a, a, a substantial uh, impact in that first remission out to five years. And if you go to the next slide, uh, overall survival doing very, very well out at five years as well. And you can see that uh, uh, even the, the doublet is doing quite well, but clearly uh, the um, the three drug uh, combo uh, is 10-15% uh, uh, better. So uh, obviously uh, in that trial, you can continue uh, with, with the combination therapy. Uh, daratumumab, one advantage of the daratumumab is that you can continue uh, to take that. Uh, other typical maintenance uh, therapies are to use Revlimid or, as a maintenance. Uh, plus or minus uh, Velcade or Nunlaro, which is uh, oral and has a lesser impact in terms of neuropathy. And you'll see that we give you a number of uh, uh, articles there, references that discuss um, uh, the role of maintenance in different settings. Uh, we would tend to use Velcade or Nunlaro in patients who have more of those uh, high-risk chromosomes on the uh, FISH testing. Next slide. So what are the overall strategies? Well, for now, the strategies are to use uh, three drugs or add in uh, a fourth drug, uh, such as uh, daratumumab or azatuximab with VRD or KRD if, if uh, kyprolis is used as the proteasome inhibitor instead of Velcade. Uh, we adjust the maintenance in terms of the risk factors. Uh, I think increasingly we want to come in early if there's any indication of relapse and come in with a, a triplet again to have a very significant uh, next remission. And now, and we'll hear about this more um, from Dr. Raj later, uh, uh, what is the impact of these uh, new, new immune therapies, which we're also looking to bring in uh, earlier uh, in patients who uh, might benefit. And obviously, uh, we're not forgetting about the caregivers and um, the International Myeloma Foundation. We're very much focused on trying to enhance our programs uh, specifically for caregivers. And uh, in, in this next uh, few months and years, we will be talking more about uh, programs and activities that are more specifically uh, targeted to help uh, caregivers uh, who are such a key part of the of the caregiving team and so uh, a lot of this is available on our website and uh, so uh, thank you for your attention i hope that this has been uh, a helpful introduction just an overview of where we are uh, really a very positive uh, situation right now in terms of uh, initial options that can be offered and then as you'll hear later in the program uh, the many backup options if uh, uh, other therapies are needed moving forward. So I'll stop there for now. And so uh, as part of the program, we, what we'll do is, is uh, move forward. I see that uh, we have um, uh, over 40 uh, questions coming into the uh, chat box already. And so 
we'll be we'll be starting to be ready to answer some of these uh, uh, questions. But in the meantime, I'd like to invite uh, Kevin uh, Briggle uh, to go ahead and and tell us about life as a canvas. So this is uh, uh, the artist and Kevin is going to uh, reveal uh, his perspective on uh, side effects and symptom management. Kevin. Thanks, Dr. Dury. And I am no artist, so this is a, a slide deck um, that's put together by the Nurse Leadership Board of the International Myeloma Foundation, of which I'm a member. It actually consists of 18 uh, nurses and advanced practice nurses. Um, and uh, this uh, slide deck is updated yearly. And the goal of the Nurse Leadership Board is really patient education and nursing education in terms of a multiple myeloma. And uh, this particular slide deck is Life is a Canvas. And so then again, this is the artist part of this. This is really thinking about, again, you're painting the picture of your treatment from, uh, from basically from uh, diagnosis uh, through the whole course of treatment and some of the things to think about uh, then as well. And this artistic theme, this is actually a short version of this particular slide deck uh, developed for this uh, webinar. And uh, you guys are the first to see it. So it changes from year to year. All right. So again, you are the canvas, and uh, um, and I am sitting in Richmond, Virginia now. Beautiful day, a little sunny, um, and a little hot. All right. So when we think about uh, um, uh, painting a picture, of course, we first have to start off with what are your goals. And I think the important part of this down here is listed in terms of discuss your goals with the priorities with your healthcare team. Now they should align. So what you think is important in life should align with what uh, your providers and, and the patient and the individuals, the individual care team who's treating you are thinking about. So in terms of the care team, they're thinking about, of course, myeloma treatment and supportive therapies. In terms of the myeloma treatment, it's the, getting that disease under control quickly. So rapid, effective disease control. We want it to be durable as well. As Dr. Jury said, now we're getting, at least with initial therapies, we could see maybe four to five year uh, duration of therapy, which is pretty impressive. And that then translates into improved overall survival, which is really what we're looking for, is increased overall survival. But along the way, minimizing side effects is always important. Uh, and again, the whole point here is allowing for that good quality of life. And that's where the supportive therapies come in. And that's preventing both disease-related uh, side effects and treatment-related side effects and managing those things. And again, that's what the Nurse Leadership Board really focuses on in terms of nursing education then as well. So optimizing symptom management and you can see, again, allowing for a good quality of life. So not just having a, quality, a longer time, but a, and, uh, improving that quality of life as well. So in terms of uh, medications, and I think uh, Dr. Jory's uh, um, touched on this as well the uh the color wheel our treatment options has never quite been quite this robust it's really pretty impressive um and across the top this is a particular slide looks across the top the various classes of drugs or agents that are available the mibs which are the proteasome inhibitors the mabs or the monoclonal antibodies the mides or the immunomodulatory agents we have steroids alkylators immunotherapy and cellular therapies. As we move down those, you can actually see some of the agents that are in those, such as Velcade, Kyprolis, and you might be familiar with all these from uh, um, things which maybe you or your, if you're a caregiver that uh, uh, the person you're caring for uh, has received. And so we're looking at really about eight different categories, 14 different drugs. We've had two approved this year. And so we're not talking about just one of these drugs, um, you know, used by itself, but again, it's a tapestry. Now we're able to mix medications and find us something that's a, it's really the perfect color for you if you want to uh, use uh, continue in that type of uh, metaphor as well. And so if we look at the most recent NCCN guidelines for relapsed refractory disease, there are seven, 47 regimens that are listed in there. So again, these are combinations of, of different regimens things as well. Now, you can see again, those medications that are listed there. Of course, across the bottom, you can see the noted side effects. And there becomes the part where we really have to manage not just the disease, but manage the side effects, potential things that are related to the therapies which we give you. And unfortunately, some of those side effects might guide and or actually suggest what treatment we might use. So if we look at that first category, we see neuropathy. We think about the drugs which cause neuropathy. Well, if a patient uh, is an older patient and has really severe diabetic neuropathy, it may negate using a specific drug because of the risk of neuropathy, worsening that neuropathy 
is going to be worse. So when we think about mixing and matching, we look at those side effects along the bottom and think about that might be part of what we choose to treat a person with as well. Again, that's just choosing the right color mixing and matching uh, for patients. Now, along those side effects, if we would think about that middle one, the steroids, that's really the big one. Uh, when we think about uh, uh, basically public enemy number one uh, for both patients is, is really th the steroids. They're pretty much in every regimen, and the bright side is they work, and that's why we put steroids in them. Unfortunately, we have to put in them at pretty high doses, but they're really a backbone drug, and they help the other drugs act better. So it's that idea of one plus one equals three or one plus one equals four. That's why they're present. And unfortunately, they are present in high doses because um, that's what it takes to really effectively combat the uh, multiple myeloma cells. The dark side, of course, shown over on the right are the steroid side effects. And I probably don't have to list, it, list read out all of those, but probably the biggest ones are the irritability, the mood swings, the depression, the difficulty sleeping is a really big one. From a more physical standpoint, the increased blood sugar levels for patients who have diabetes can be a challenge, and sometimes we'll have to uh, get in contact with primary care providers to help uh, help manage that as well. But how do we manage that? How do we help you manage some of those side effects? And uh, over on the left, we talk about a consistent schedule. So with some patients who work five days a week, they may have the weekend off, and so a better time to give them their, their drugs might be on that weekend or on that Friday when they can have a little bit of time to recover. Um, patients may work in the, during the day, they may work at night for patients who work um, during the day and want a good night's sleep very often we'll have our patients take uh, their steroids that, that evening so they get a good night's sleep by the time those uh, more psychological side effects, the irritability and things like that take effect, it will be in the morning and so have a little bit of time to recover. Steroids are generally better taken with food. It's a little bit easier on the stomach. And sometimes it they, they basically put a lot of acid in the stomach. So we think of over-the-counter medications can be good. Sometimes it requires uh, prescription uh, medications as well. So we fully understand the steroid side effects and we do work to reduce the dose of those steroids uh, as soon as possible as well. So we don't have to continue that all the way out, fortunately. Uh, very few maintenance regimens uh, involve those, uh, those high-dose steroids. So if we were to look at other um, side effects that we think about then as well, so again, what are other tools we use to complete the picture? Um, these are some other side effects that uh, we think about when uh, managing um, uh, patients with multiple myeloma. Those are listed across the top, DVTs or uh, the deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary emboli, again, preventing those. We're always concerned about bone health because patients, about 70, 80% of patients are going to have some sort of bone uh, issue uh, related with their multiple myeloma. Renal health is very important. Uh, the pathology of, uh, of uh, multiple myeloma unfortunately causes kidney dysfunction. And uh, we talk about infection prevention as well, which is really big thing again this whole COVID that's going on now and the, and the big component of this uh, uh, webinar today then peripheral neuropathy and GI symptoms and we'll focus on those a little bit more later but along the left there you can see there are non-medication therapies for these and lifestyle options so we think of uh, pulmonary and we do of course we do have uh, pharmacologic options as well but these are some things you can think about doing that are not pharmacologic so DVT PE prevention compression stockings are important activity so if you're going on a long drive or on a plane trip get up and walk those types of things uh, smoke Smoking is associated with uh, pulmonary embolus as well, and so is uh, com um, uh, obesity. In terms of the bone health, uh, really activity is a very, very big one. We do have agents, as was pointed out early, the bisphosphonates or the denosumab, which can really help with bone health. But sometimes we, we require radiation or surgery or physical therapy activity and really important to help uh, strengthen the bones as well. Uh, the renal health, unfortunately, patients will sometimes need dialysis. We hope to get them off dialysis, but a huge focus for the patients with multiple myeloma is hydration. So plenty of fluids keep those kidneys uh, uh, flushed and functioning well, avoid agents that uh, can cause some kidney dysfunction, such as uh, NSAIDs, think of aspirin, ibuprofen, CT contrasts, and things like that. Infection prevention, masking activity. I know masking gets kind of a, a plus minus um, among the uh, general population, but uh, I'm sure everybody else on the uh, um, talk today can assure you that uh, for the at least 25 years I've been in oncology, uh, oncology patients have masked all the time. And so masking is something now that uh, the rest of the, I always say the rest of the world, our, our, our patients were really kind of trendsetters, that they were always masking and uh, doing all the good things, hand washing, avoiding crowds and things like that. So those things are always really good. We think about being at home, uh, um, basically cleaning those things that are commonly used, refrigerator handles, uh, iPads, keyboards, uh, things like that then as well. So infection prevention is a huge component of teaching. And it's listed here, peripheral neuropathy and GI symptoms and all 
talk about those a little bit later here then as well. Now, if we go ahead and say, we ask patients, we say, well, what's, what bothers you and mo what most impacts your quality of life? And that, that's a really important question. You know, we think we know, but there was a large study meta-analysis which really looked at a whole large number of studies and compiled the information and said, okay, what is a huge symptom that impacts your quality of life? And they're going from diagnosis all the way through end of life. And you could put these into three broad categories, the physical, psychological and financial. So we look down the physical, see fatigue, constipation, pain, those types of things, psychological, depression, anxiety, uh, sleep disturbance, insomnia. Of course, financial, it, that kind of is its own uh, uh, obvious um, problem there, the financial burden and financial toxicity. Now, not all of these are specific to physical or psychological, and we'll talk about how fatigue, while we think it is physical, also has a, a component in the psychological uh, um, uh, realm as well. But if we want to focus on just a few of the um, uh, physical ones, which we have here, um, GI symptoms. And so we think about constipation and diarrhea. Fortunately, the vast majority, the, the majority of the agents which we use to treat multiple myeloma do not cause nausea and vomiting. There are a couple that do, but the majority of them do not. However, constipation and diarrhea can really be uh, quite significant. So we think about those agents that cause those. And of course, we can, uh, we, we can work on that, but also think about the non-treatment related drugs that you might be taking that are contributing to that. Shown on the left for diarrhea, if you're taking laxatives, antacids with magnesium, some antibiotics, antidepressants, and some of those things that you might think, uh, like herbs and things like that, which might be helpful, can lead to um, diarrhea then as well. So think about those things, look at your med list. Um, I always have patients bring in their meds, including the, the over-the-counter and herbal supplements as well, so we can look at those things. In terms of how do we manage it, avoid caffeinated, carbonated, heavily sugared beverages, is, uh, take your antidiarrheal medication. Imodium is over the counter. Some of these other ones here, Lamoto, Colested, Well Call, uh, those require uh, prescriptions if necessary. And then fiber binding agents, Metamucil, Citrusel. Again, those agents bind fluid. And when they bind fluid, they bulk up the. Uh, uh, the stool and, and make that a little bit less loose, and that's the important thing. In terms of constipation, again, some of our medications can, our treatment medications, but also think about what you might be taking. Some opioid pain reliever, relievers, which are really significant uh, in terms of uh, constipation, think of art, um, some antidepressants, some supplements. Uh, patients can certainly get constipated with calcium and iron, which are probably the uh, two most significant ones. And again, you'll see here, what do we do for this? Well, you can do something at home, which is again, increase your fiber. So fruits, fibers, vegetables, whole fiber grains. And again, think of those, high, those fiber binding agents. What do they do? They hold onto water. So they help prevent diarrhea by bulking up the stool. Here, they can help uh, prevent the hard stools that you get by by holding onto the water and helping with uh, constipation. In the blue box down there in that little palette, we can see that fluid intake can help with both diarrhea. We don't want you getting dehydrated. You can help with constipation as well to help again put fluid into that. And then most importantly, again, kidney function. We're always telling patients to drink plenty of fluids. And so we can help GI and renal issues by uh, drinking uh, plenty of fluids. Probably the other one, which is uh, pretty significant all the way down the line, is pain prevention and management. And, and, and pain very often is the number one presenting symptom when it comes to patients with a multiple myeloma. And it can continue throughout the whole that the whole disease trajectory. But sources include the, the bone disease itself. Uh, neuropathy can be a significant, of course, uh, significant uh, uh, cause and medical procedures as well that we that we perform ourselves. How about management? Well, prevent it was at all possible. That's probably the big thing. And Dr. Jury discussed again those bone streaking agents, uh, the zomata, the, uh, uh, the denosumab, things like that, which help strengthen the bones. We always think of antivirals to prevent outbreaks of shingles, which can be extremely painful also. Um, but what about interventions? What if we can't What if we can't do something about the pain, prevented it? Well, it really depends upon the type of pain as well. Um, so neuropathic pain is treated different than bone pain. And so some interventions could be we have med medications, again, opioids or something lesser, activity, surgical intervention, radiation is very often used to uh, take care of bone pain then as well. And then some complementary therapies as well, just some uh, meditation, yoga, supplements, acupuncture can be very effective. Unfortunately, it's not paid for by most insurances, but I've had patients who had great success uh, with uh, acupuncture. Now, when we think of a probably a more specific type of pain, it's that peripheral neuropathy. Um, that's a pain which is really, really difficult to manage. And, and, and instead of managing it, probably the most important part here is lifts it again in that little blue palette down at the bottom. And it says, report symptoms of peripheral neuropathy early 
to your healthcare provider. Nerve damage can be permanent. And so what we like to do is prevent the neuropathy rather than treat the neuropathy. And we have a number of agents that uh, certainly can cause uh, neuropathy as well. One of the problems is if the neuropathy gets so bad, we may have to discontinue a drug. And we don't want to discontinue a drug that's working um, and, tr and effectively treating your myeloma just because the neuropathy has gotten so worse. So when we think of peripheral neuropathy up here on the left, it says numbness, tingling, prickling, and even muscle weakness, cramps, things like that as well. Those are things to report uh, to your provider, uh, which would suggest uh, the neuropathy. When we think of management, um, up here on the right, prevention management uh, for the patients getting the bortezomib uh, twice weekly. Uh, we can go to once weekly dosing. The subcutaneous administration causes a lot less uh, neuropathy as well. Um, massage in area, dry skin tends to uh, have issues more with uh, neuropathy than, uh, than uh, uh, moist skin, so keep it, uh, keep it well lubricated. We can have some supplements as well, which uh, seem to help with some people, B, B vitamins, some amino acids as well. There's some, again, herbs that are suggested to help. What we, what we don't know is how some of these might interact with the medications that you're taking. So let's say you're getting a, a bortezomib infusion as listed on here. Don't take those herbs on the same day just because we don't know how that uh, how they interact. If the neuropathy worsens, what might we do? Well, we might, again, we might have to change your treatment if we can't do anything about it. But we can also do dose reductions. Very often, if patients report neuropathy, we do dose reductions, and the medication still is very effective. We think about how these medications are approved. We're really looking at the, the medication that we can give you has, has a great effect, but it's really the maximum tolerated uh, dose and lesser doses, partial doses work really, really well. So don't think that reporting the symptoms means that your therapy is going to be uh, any less effective. If it gets really bad, we can also prescribe you know med medications as well. Sometimes opioids and again physical therapy. Sometimes acupuncture is uh, going to be available then as well. Um, fatigue. If you recall, fatigue was listed under um, the physical um, category when we looked at those quality of life measures. And it's listed here under physical and psychological. Um, and over on the left, you see that fatigue is the most commonly reported symptom. Almost 100% of patients with multiple myeloma at some point are going to complain of fatigue. Now, it's listed on this slide again as both fatigue, anxiety, depression. And that's, that's a triad. It's very often because they go hand in hand. The fatigue can cause anxiety and depression, and the depression and anxiety can cause fatigue. So it's working on all of those uh, together, not just, the, not just one or the other. So nausea is the most, we think about the most commonly reported one, but the sources over there on the left are shown to be anemia, pain, uh, reduced activity, uh, insomnia, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, toxicity, bone marrow suppression. So some of those physical things are things related to the therapy that we can help take care of. But over on the right, again, these are, these are more the psychological things. Anxiety reported more than 35% of patients with myeloma, depression, and, and nearly 25% of patients. You can see the reasons for it. Financial concerns, disease progression, end of life issues, changes in social and sexual function scenes. So all of these things, we have to work on those. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, anxiety and depression aren't always that well reported to providers. And so when we think about this triad, fatigue, anxiety, depression, we want to work on all of those. And I would suggest to you that uh, if these things are bothering the anxiety, depression. Sometimes there's a stigma, which says we shouldn't bring about, talk about those things or bring them up. But, but really, we should because there's help available. Um, we can certainly um, have pharmacologic uh, help for the anxiety and depression, but also uh, point you in directions of social workers and, and um, uh, counseling and things like that that, uh, that we have available, which can help. So curing one or helping one can certainly help the, um, all three of these things as well. All right, sticking then into the uh, rest and relaxation and keeping into the psychological theme here. Again, one of the things that we saw with um, uh, the, uh, the quality of life measures, one really important one was that sleep disturbance. And uh, so sleep disturbance is just important if you're being treated for multiple myeloma, but it has a number of problems in terms of your overall health. Those are listed up here on the left. Again, adequate sleep and rest are essential to a healthful lifestyle. So if you have disturbed sleep, uh, interrupted sleep, you can have you can have increased heart disease, anxiety, weakened immune system, worsened pain, and of course, uh, you can have stumbles and falls and personal injury as well. 
What interferes with sleep? Well, sometimes it's what we do. And of course, I brought up the point, steroids. Those can be the, probably the biggest problem when we think about your th with your therapy that can interfere with sleep. But there are other things as well that you might be taking, stimulants. And again, think about those other supplements you might take in the herbal supplements, things like that. Let us look at them because some of those, instead of actually helping you, can, uh, can also lead to some uh, um, issues in terms of sleep disturbances. We have the, the physiologic things as well, patients with sleep apnea, if you've been prescribed CPAP, you should be wearing that. Heart issues, pain can uh, can uh, be associated with uh, with difficulty as well. And of course, those things again we just mentioned: fear, anxiety, stress, depression. All of those can lead to uh, a poor uh, poor sleep, a poor restful sleep. Um, on this right side is probably stuff that you've all heard before, but sleep hygiene is really necessary for that good quality restful nighttime sleep. Exercise is great during the day, just don't do it real close to sleep. Um, avoid daytime napping. I would say excessive daytime napping, and that's simply because if you sleep during the day, it's going to be very difficult to sleep during the night because you'll get your restful sleep during the day, and even with uh, some sort of pharmacologic thing, if you need that, it's going to be very difficult to get a full good night's sleep. But I was talking about establishing a bedtime routine. Here it's a warm bath, cup of milk or tea. Some people will read for a little while. Some people will knit or something like that, but get that pattern Pattern. When you're ready to go to bed, get the pattern um, that you want to go to sleep. Um, but uh, uh, the important part about this, too, is that next line is this, associate your bed only with sleep. So don't go in there and watch TV if you're having those bedtime things. Typically, um, don't do those things. Um, you know, do your little bit of knitting in, the, in the, whatever room you're in, things like that. But when you go to your bedroom, then you're ready for sleep and associate that bed with sleep. And I do tell patients that they do take their cat naps during the day, that they should not go to their bed and do those. And again, associate that bed with only a restorative nighttime sleep if you're going to nap during the day. You do it in the chair. Um, sometimes, regardless, your sleep aid may be needed. That's absolutely true. So, um, uh, and we can help you with that then. There's some over-the-counter ones as well. Um, before bedtime, these things I think are obvious. Avoid caffeine, nicotine, large meals, and a lot of computer screen time that's really going to um, kind of uh, keep you a little bit wired. Okay, and then this slide kind of says it all. This was a third category in terms of quality of life and financial burden. Our drugs are really expensive. When we think about some of the immunomodulatory agents, which are running 20000 a month, we can really see why people uh, have a lot of angst about, about finances and, uh, and treating their myeloma. Over on the left, talk about financial burden coming from premiums, co-payments, travel expenses, medical prescribing, and those prescription costs. And loss of income is a big one, too. And not just for the patient. So the patient can have loss of income. But what about a caregiver? Right? to bring that patient to work. They can have loss of income uh, then as well. Um, there is some help available and I, certainly contact social services, contact a social worker uh, where you get treated. They should have some resources available. You can see some of the funding assistance that uh, can be available here, the federal programs. Some pharmaceutical companies have really nice support si systems. Um, there's some great nonprofits out there as well. And again, any social worker should be able to direct you to these. Um, there's a lot of information on the web as well. And if you're not capable, there are probably uh, some uh, family member that you know can really help direct you to those things as well. So those are the broad categories and the, some of the things that uh, um, that we look out for. And so the last thing I'd like to do is just a shout out to to, to everybody who's on this uh, um, on this uh, program today is the fact that uh, you know knowledge is power. This and use reputable sources. You're doing it today. You're here at this International Myeloma Foundation um, seminar, listening to some experts talk about myeloma. Great. If you're not doing this live again, I think this is recorded, so you can actually listen to this at some other point. Um, but the International Myeloma Foundation has a lot of stuff available online, and you can see the website uh, there as well. So anyway, with that, I'm going to turn this uh, back over to Dr. Jury. I believe uh, it's yours now. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for that wonderful, comprehensive uh, uh, overview. Uh, in the chat box, you can see already some comments from patients who really, really appreciate uh, the, the details that you've provided. And um, uh, we'll be trying to answer a number of the questions that are coming in. And uh, thanks to Rafat, who has already been jumping in to try to answer some of the uh, important questions. And we'll try to do that. If we can answer them uh, just directly in the chat box, we'll do that. And those that we don't, we'll try to cover uh, uh, before this first uh, break. So without further ado, I'll uh, give a, a short presentation about uh, COVID-19 
and uh, leave enough time so that we can uh, handle a lot of your different questions that um, I know that you have and have already been uh, been coming in. Uh, next slide. So, so just some background information for those who want to keep up. Uh, you can go uh, to the CDC and WHO websites, and you can see where is COVID uh, active right now. Unfortunately, you can see the dark, dark blue includes the United States, uh, as we're all unfortunately very well aware in, in most of our communities. Uh, you can see that Latin America is badly affected, as is uh, Western uh, Europe. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, COVID infections right now in the unvaccinated uh, due to this new uh, Delta variant. And if you want to track uh, the amount of vaccination, which is helpful to know, you know, what is the percentage chance that when you go out that people are vaccinated? Uh, uh, one interesting thing is if you look at the very bottom here, people over the age of 65, the number vaccinated is up in the 90% range, uh, 80, 90%. So uh, if you if you stick in that older age range, uh, likely the people are vaccinated. Uh, what you need to be wary of is uh, younger people uh, who are not vaccinated and uh, uh, younger people and even children who have not had the opportunity uh, to, to be uh, vaccinated. Next slide. So I think that the Delta variant is really an important development for all of us. Uh, and the, the last couple of weeks, I've written uh, blogs about it this last week. It included a commentary about the role of the booster. So uh, those of you interested in that, you can see I've got references and links about the booster already in the blog, which came out on uh, on Thursday. But the Delta variant is just so much more uh, infectious. Uh, and you can see, instead of uh, passing the infection on to just a couple of people, it could be five, eight, nine people that get infected. And this is because the load of the virus in, in the nose and upper throat area with this Delta variant is 1,000 times higher. And so the, the, the risk of spread, uh, even from, an, uh, from a vaccinated person uh, who might have uh, somewhat lower antibody levels, uh, uh, can happen. Uh, and so this is why it is of significant uh, concern. So vaccination for myeloma patients, Thumbs up, absolutely, uh, particularly the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which have proven to be uh, very, very uh, safe and reliable. Uh, I think that there are definitely issues uh, for myeloma patients related to the impact of ongoing treatment, and we can uh, bring that up in the discussion. Uh, but just use some common sense. Uh, if there's a break in your treatment, or if you could perhaps uh, uh, limit a maintenance for a little bit of time, uh, then this could be a good time to get vaccinated. Um, next slide. Yeah, and so it is possible to check uh, the key antibodies, the neutralizing antibody uh, levels. Uh, there are some labs which are more reliable than others. Uh, a national lab, which is really quite reputable, uh, a company called LabCore, uh, they do have this as a reliable testing service across the country. Uh, it, within each state, there are a number of quite reliable places where samples can be set. Uh, but for myeloma patients, uh, the key thing which I emphasized in my most recent blog is that uh, about half of the time, myeloma patients do not get adequate uh, neutralizing antibody levels even after two doses of the, of the Pfizer or Moderna uh, tested, you know, two to three weeks after that second dose. And so it was fantastic uh, this week that on Thursday, the FDA approved a third booster dose, and this was approved by uh, the CDC uh, yesterday. And uh, this approval uh, is for individuals who are immunocompromised, which absolutely includes uh, uh, every patient with uh, myeloma and possibly even uh, smoldering myeloma and uh, MGUS. Uh, uh, a key point is that you do not need to have a letter or a note from your doctor to get this third shot. 
the patient just needs to, in the words of the CDC, attest or declare that they're in this immunocompromised group, and then you can go ahead and get the shot. Uh, it's approved uh, just for the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, the booster should be given uh, sometime after four weeks after uh, the, the second dose. For those of you who were vaccinated some time ago, that means that you could go in any time and get that booster dose. Now, uh, even with the booster dose, it may be uh, that your neutralizing antibodies are still not uh, spectacularly high, and especially with this Delta variant, which is so infectious, it's strongly, strongly encouraged. And the CDC have now become quite clear on this, that they do continue to recommend uh, masks. And I certainly recommend uh, the KN95 mask, the best that you can get, or you can even use double masking to get the best protection. And be very, very cautious in indoor spaces particularly if you're mixing with people that you don't know, people who might, uh, in fact, be not vaccinated. So Pfizer and Moderna are best. Uh, if you've had the J&J &J in some places, for example, in San Francisco, San Francisco General Hospital, uh, you can go in and get uh, Pfizer or Moderna if you happen to have received the J&J &J in the past. And now uh, there is a feeling that you could possibly mix and match uh, Pfizer and Moderna. For example, if you had Moderna before, your booster uh, preferably would be the Moderna, but I mean, if you can get the Pfizer, it's probably okay. And that is with, that's allowed within these new uh, guidelines. Uh, but the key thing is for those who are vaccinated, and I do believe with this third booster, there will be hopefully 100% reduction of hospitalizations and deaths. So it really is such an important thing. Mass still required. It's an airborne spread. The variants are a challenge. And be wary. I mean, uh, many people who may be transmitting the uh, infection are without symptoms. They may not know that they have the infection. They, they may be vaccinated and feeling quite safe and actually feeling quite well, but still they could have some infection in the nose, and especially younger people, and still uh, be very cautious about travel and planes, trains, uh, and just be very cautious about any crowded indoor spaces. I think the uh, KN95 or double masking, and uh, if you're very worried, you can wear glasses or goggles. Next slide. What can you do once you're vaccinated? And this this has kind of evolved. There's a lot of advice out there right now what you can do once you're vaccinated. But this um, Delta variant has kind of changed the, the perspective on that. Uh, next slide. And I think that you just need to be just so much more cautious. There are things that you can do, uh, but... Uh, wear a mask and just be very careful, even in social settings, outdoors, like a barbecue, particularly if you're around people that you don't know or who might not be uh, vaccinated. Next slide. Go for a walk, very important for myeloma patients to get out and about, uh, go for a walk, wear your mask. Uh, and if you're out in the open, obviously uh, you can take your mask off if you're taking a, a uh, a, a walk in the park or through the woods or something like that. Uh, some places that you might need to go, there are very, very good protections, like in the dentist office, if you've got to go to the dentist, uh, they are uh, particularly taking very good precautions with masking and the like. So it's probably uh, good with care. As you were just hearing about, it's common uh, for uh, myeloma patients to have fatigue, but but really, the COVID-19 pandemic has been stressful for everyone. And uh, when you get up in the morning, uh, you may not be feeling so resilient. And it takes uh, teamwork and help, uh, you know, to get ready for that next uh, Zoom appointment uh, to talk to your doctor or to do this and that. And so uh, just be aware to give yourself time and, and really uh, be aware that this is something that, that might need uh, counseling or help, because it's not so easy to get through all of this. Next slide. 
Yes, it's real for everyone. And there are some crazy things that you can do. Uh, this is a fun uh, video that I like that was pretty popular two or three months back. Uh, the, the Shed Aquarium uh, took the uh, penguins out for a walk, and it turned out that the penguins are quite inquisitive. And so it's wonderful to watch what the penguins do when they when you take them out for a walk around the aquarium where they check out the dolphins and, and the other otters and the like. But then they started taking them outside of the aquarium to the uh, to the museums and around and about. And this is really a, a fun thing to do to de-stress. And maybe you yourself could go to the museum with, with good masking and with good spacing uh, to, to try to recover and and work on your resilience. And we have a lot of uh, information available to try to help uh, build your resilience and, and uh, help during these challenging times. What does the future hold? Well, uh, as I've said, um, uh, vaccination I consider to be essential and I would recommend every patient to get a booster shot. Uh, and we can talk about questions you might have about that. Uh, I think masks are still strongly recommended in any situation of risk, particularly indoors. Uh, and beyond that, I think that we are looking at a situation like this um, for some time to come, where uh, there probably will be uh, new boosters uh, uh, next year uh, that will do a better job uh, against uh, new variants as they come along. Uh, I do think that we will be having to keep our masks in our pockets uh, for, for quite some time uh, to use them if we're traveling or uh, meeting uh, people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, around the world, many, many countries have uh, even uh, less vaccination than we have. And so uh, we have to remember that we're living in a global community and travel does need to happen for business and other things and travel. And, uh, you know, so we, we're going to have to be cautious in our lives, both locally and especially if we're traveling for, for quite some time to come. So uh, we have many resources, as, as Kevin was emphasizing, and uh, uh, these resources include uh, uh, materials from uh, the experts that you have uh, with us here today, uh, uh, as well as many others who have uh, being kind enough uh, to tape their their presentations on, on many different topics, and we're very happy uh, to be able to make these available to patients. Uh, our support groups are virtual, but as you can see here uh, with the many happy faces, uh, our virtual support group meetings have been, I think, hugely uh, um, popular, uh, if that's a correct word. Uh, I think that people have really appreciated uh, the ability to get together um, and uh, see how other people are doing, get advice and the like. Uh, and uh, in fact, there has been a high level of participation in these uh, Zoom kind of meetings uh, from all across the country. And uh, great thanks uh, to Robin Tui and, and their team and our uh, also our uh, regional community workshop uh, team, including uh, Kelly Cox, uh, who, who have really helped enormously to, to uh, expand these activities and to uh, Rafat and Nupur, who, who have also participated in some of our programs. Uh, even uh, when it's very, very bad, uh, things continue. Myeloma has no boundaries. Nature continues to grow. When you look out the window, uh, even although we're having a lot of problems, uh, uh, the seasons continue, even although uh, we have these uh, deep concerns about the climate right at the minute, but mostly we're hanging in there and uh, doing the best that we can. Okay, so I'll stop there. And with that, we really do have uh, uh, a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, uh, but perhaps uh, we can start by maybe uh, uh, inviting uh, our, our guest speakers here to, to maybe comment, particularly uh, major uh, points that, that they would like to make about um, 
the COVID-19 and uh, particularly related to the to the booster shots, perhaps. Uh, so, so maybe uh, start with you, Nooper. Would you like what what comments would you have about about the current situation with the COVID-19? I think you uh, can you hear me, Brian? Yes. Yes. Perfect. I think you summed it up beautifully. I think the Delta variant is really important for all of us to think about. And I agree 110%. I think anybody and everybody who can get a booster should get a booster. Um, I think all multiple myeloma patients can be categorized as immunocompromised. Uh, I don't think you need to show any kind of proof. And if you can get the vaccine, it's just going to augment your immune response. Um, so I would urge all our patients as and when the uh, vaccine becomes available to get whichever one they can have access to. Right. Do you have any thinking about the therapy? There's a lot of questions about adjustments in therapy around vaccination, which is very tricky because we don't want to interrupt therapy, which is really working well. Uh, any particular thoughts about that? I think it's really important, and I think what we've done as a myeloma community is looked at outcomes in patients who have myeloma and have developed COVID. And what we have been able to uh, sort of uh, uh, gather from that is it's really important to control your multiple myeloma as well as you can. That's important for control of COVID as well as response to vaccination. Um, so I don't think you should interrupt treatment. I think you, uh, it's really important to continue with treatment. As far as vaccination and treatment is concerned, Brian, you bring up a really important point. We do know that there are certain types of treatments which can interfere with your immune system. Specifically, uh, monoclonal antibodies, for example, can dampen your immune system a little bit. So if you're getting something like isotuximab or deratumumab, stay away from it for a few weeks before you get your vaccine. Uh, right. Be away from things like steroids would be helpful as well. And some of the proteasome inhibitors, the immunomodulatory drugs, though, We've shown over and over again, if you're on pomalidomide, if you're on lenalidomide, for example, they, in fact, will augment your immune response to vaccine as well. Yeah, so you don't need um, to, to worry right. about that. So, so, so Rafat, uh, other thoughts uh, you'd like to add in here uh, in your practice? What are you seeing that is of importance or concern? Yeah. No, I, I think both of you really outline everything uh, uh, thoroughly. Um, I just want to emphasize the uh, the treatment that directly affect plasma cells, such as NTCD38, deratumumab, isatuximab, or BM, BCMA antibody therapy or CAR T cells. Definitely deplete your antibodies, and uh, you know antibody, you know neutralizing antibody, as are important part of the immune system. Obviously, it's not the only part that will help you uh, get rid of uh, COVID uh, infection. You need antibodies and you need cellular immunity. So, uh, but in terms of the antibody, if you are, you, you know, going to get a vaccine, as you heard from Dr. Raj, you have to, you know, uh, probably, I think the most important thing is really after you get the vaccine is that you wait at least four weeks to get one of these drugs that can affect the plasma cells, deratumumab, right. isatuximab. So there's data came out of France published uh, recently, and we actually have uh, data on 398 patients. We're doing the analysis. And if you're giving an NTCD38 more than once a month, you're not going to develop an immune response. Uh -huh. Once a month maintenance kind of schedule or every other month, and you time the vaccine correctly, you can develop an antibodies and you can maintain it. So that's, very I think, the most important point. Point. Very, you need to very, pay attention to. Very, very helpful. Thank you. So, so uh, Kevin, uh, thoughts from your perspective uh, about the, the COVID-19? Well, I think you guys covered a lot of it, uh, but one of the things what we will tell patients is that, uh, uh, such as those patients who are on RVD, a weekly regimen, is probably not to get the vaccine on the same day that they take their steroid. And if we can separate those, or if they're on a 3-1 right. schedule and they do an off week, to take get the get it on a week when they're not getting the, uh, the high-dose dex. Right. Very, very, very good. 
Yeah, so I'm looking at the chat box here and we can maybe go through together. Oh, uh, start at the top, just leave it at the top there. Yeah, um, so, um, oh, where was it? Uh, okay, is, yeah, so one question is, uh, is the booster vaccine different than the current vaccine? And so that is c uh, confusing. Is uh, So right now, uh, the booster is just the same as the one from before. It's just a third dose. So a better terminology is actually a third dose because uh, we are anticipating that there will be boosters coming either later this year, or probably early next year, which will be different, which will be fine-tuned uh, against uh, the Delta and potentially other variants. And so, but this one is just a third dose of either the Pfizer or the Moderna. And it is good to take uh, whatever it was that you got before, although between the Pfizer and Moderna, they're both this mRNA uh, type of a vaccine. And so uh, it's probably okay to mix and match those, although we don't really have uh, a lot of data on that yet. Um, and then there's questions coming in about the maintenance, and then you got some some good advice there about maintenance. Uh, uh, really, if you can have a little bit of a gap, it will definitely help your uh, antibody response. Uh, and then someone is asking, uh, get a Velcade shot. Uh, yeah, it, it obviously, it would be good to to potentially uh, skip one week. You know, we. Uh, as uh, Nooper was emphasizing, we do not want to compromise your ongoing therapy, but minor modifications could really help perhaps your your uh, antibody response to the vaccine. Uh, I'm just seeing if there are any other uh, questions that relate to the COVID that we can cover right now. Um, uh, there's, there's several questions about the timing. Um, What's the best time uh, to get it? Uh, no would be the answer to that. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't scroll down and see if there are any others. Um, yeah, so I think that um, there, there are several sites. There's a, there's a question about the KN95 mask. There are several sites that do uh, online. I, I don't want to give brand identification, but you can definitely get the legitimate uh, KN95 masks, which were in scarce supply earlier, or uh, just uh, double masking uh, is very effective. There are several studies on that, just to wear a double mask. If you're out and about and you feel like you might be in contact with someone who's not vaccinated or at risk, especially indoors. Uh, I'm just seeing if there are any other immediate questions on the uh, COVID. Uh, th th there are different types of antibody testing, you know, uh, so the neutralizing antibody and then there's also the other antibody tests um, which uh, the, against the spike protein, which basically were used quite a bit, many of them widely, just to see if you'd been exposed to the virus, but was not really uh, quantitating. Uh, and uh, so some groups have been emphasizing now that um, with this neutralizing antibody test, uh, you can do it uh, in, a, in a quantitative way. It, it's, it's what's called a PCR test. So you can you can tell uh, not if you just if you have an antibody is uh, do you have a lot of antibody or you know a moderate amount of antibody and so some people are saying that actually especially the group out of San Francisco are saying that uh, uh, looking at the PCR results might be helpful in, in assessing the status. Uh, Yeah, I'm just looking to see a, a number of other questions here. Um, uh, any of our guests have any other uh, final comments of the, on the COVID before we'll move ahead? There are a number of other types of questions that we can just cover uh, briefly before we go to the break here. Um, Brian, I'll just add one thing for patients yeah. because 
I know they get uh, worried uh, if they see a low antibody response. Remember that your antibody response is just one part of your immune system. There is something right. known as T-cell immune response as well. And as of right now, we're not regularly measuring that. We're doing that in some research studies. So even if you don't have a very robust antibody response, the fact that you've had your vaccine um, is probably a good thing because it's woken up some of your T-cells for sure. Right. I think that this is really, really an important point, uh, which uh, accounts for the fact that, in general, patients who have been vaccinated really do much better, uh, even if the antibody responses are maybe not quite as good, because there is what the cellular immune response. There are other responses that are protecting you, and these are uh, uh, quite quite important. And so... Um, uh, there's there's a very strong correlation between having the vaccination, and I think that the third uh, dose will really move uh, even the majority of myeloma patients uh, up into the range where they'll have this protection against severe illness or, or the need to be uh, hospitalized. Uh, Brian, right. there was a question about the timing of the vaccine after autologous stem cell transplant. Right, and right. That's a question on yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, so traditionally we have started vaccinating people about six months after autologous stem cell transplant for hepatitis and, and uh, you know, inf uh, influenza, diphtheria, things like that. There's really no uh, clear data when to do it, but because of the pandemics, we've been starting to do it early, two to three months after autologous stem cell transplant, and our patients are developing neutralizing antibody. So I think, you know, um, I think discuss it with your, you know, transplant physician, your myeloma doctors, but consider doing it earlier. Right, I, I agree with that. One other point, and I'd be interested in an in input from from our guests here, uh, is that right at the minute, uh, I'm suggesting uh, to patients who are kind of scheduled to come in from autologous stem cell transplant right now is perhaps. Uh, maybe uh, delay that transplant for two or three months right now just because of this uh, Delta variant surge is probably not the best time to be coming into a hospital, certainly in, in, in different parts of the country. And so uh, I know that we went from uh, not doing transplants uh, through the spring into the early summer. We got back where we're doing transplants again. Uh, but then right now, I think it might be reasonable to perhaps delay a transplant for, for two or three months. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you're living in Mississippi or, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, you know, um, probably you can delay it. I mean, I think it's, the therapy is great right now and keeping the disease under control. You know, uh, you can collect right. the stem cells to them and do the transplant later. You know, right. um, probably not a bad idea during, you know, this uh, peak that we see. Right, right, right. Okay, so let's just touch on some of the other kinds of questions uh, which have been uh, uh, answered. Uh, let's see, imaging, um, question about imaging. Um, there was a, a study presented uh, at the meetings, uh, I think it was ASCO, that um, uh, MRI can be more sensitive than uh, than, than PET CT, for example, uh, and so uh, it, it's important just to, to to think about the types of imaging. Um, CT uh, shows bone damage, and so whole body low dose CT is the most sensitive in picking up any indications of, of even tiny lesions that are damaging the bone. Um, MRI uh, can can pick up disease uh, in the marrow uh, e even if there's not uh, bone damage and is actually very sensitive. And this study that was presented uh, earlier in the year showed that it, it picks up more areas where the myeloma is, is existing uh, uh, because there are some of those where there's not actually bone damage. Uh, and then the big thing about the PET CT is that it's telling us something different. The PET... Uh, positive emission tomography. This is where you inject a tiny amount of sugar, uh, which is F18 radio labeled, and so it tells you if the spot of myeloma is active and growing. And so it gives you a little bit of more precise information about whether uh, something that you might see on an MRI 
is it uh, growing or not? And so it depends on the question. If you want to know if you have a spot of myeloma which is active, uh, PET CT might be might be the way to go. Um, looking at some of these other questions here. Um, Oh, um, in the um, in the um, uh, risk uh, scoring for smoldering myeloma, we actually do use high risk cytogenetics. So, um, uh, in the scoring system, if you have smoldering myeloma and you have high risk features, uh, you do get a couple of extra points in the scoring system for that. Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think. Uh, Rafat, you answered some questions related to uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, yeah. Dr. Raji knows all about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Someone was saying that uh, they were getting uh, denosumab rather than um, uh, than Iridia or, or Zumeda. Do you have any uh, overall thoughts about um, uh, bone therapy right now, uh, uh, Nupur? I mean... Uh, uh, what's the status in terms of uh, broad use of um, Zomeda versus uh, daratumumab uh, against Iridia? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I think it's important that anybody who's getting active therapy for myeloma get a bone-targeted agent, and you can choose between uh, denosumab or zolotronic acid. Uh, either one or the other is perfectly reasonable to use. Um, I do think, um, you know, the, we've done a large randomized trial comparing the two, and both were equally efficacious in terms of controlling bone uh, disease. Uh, I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, some of them, denosumab, for example, is given subcutaneously. So if you're on completely oral treatment, don't need it. An IV, it's an easier drug for folks to take. Um, uh, but as far as skeletal related events are concerned, both were equally effective. We did see somewhat of a disease um, a specific benefit with denosumab when we studied it in the large randomized trial, but really one or the other is perfectly reasonable. Right, right. So there is one question that comes up, um, particularly if you're taking the, the denosumab. In general, we're recommending a, a, a limited therapy, like uh, two years, let's say, of therapy, and then you can stop. But if you stop the denosumab, uh, you might have to have some degree of caution and maybe use uh, a bisphosphonate uh, uh, after that. Uh, what's your feeling about that? Uh, yeah, when you no, have, I think, you stop, what do you yeah. think? Uh, so you shouldn't stop a drug like denosumab uh, completely. The reason is it's a reversible monoclonal antibody. You're going to have activation of the rank ligand system, and you do not want that. So for whatever reason, if you stop the denosumab at the back end using one dose of a bisphosphonate like zoledronic acid is important. Otherwise, right. there's an increased risk of increased fractures, uh, just stopping denosumab. Um, we do use it less frequently. We have some data to support that. In uh, certainly with zoledronic acid, where we've gone to every three months, there's randomized data with that. We have uh, single arm data, and denosumab is being studied in that context as well right now. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, well, I think that uh, we've used up our time, and we've tried to cover most of the questions. and. Those that we've not covered, we will try to get back to people. So thanks to our guests, and uh, we'll take a 10-minute break or so, and we'll be back at um, uh, 11, uh, well, actually, 45 minutes after the hour, I would say. <laughs> All right, so welcome back to everyone. Uh, I think we all enjoyed to have a short break here, uh, but we're ready to reconvene. So uh, I hope all of our guests are uh, ready to take notes. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Nupur Raj from uh, uh, Mass General uh, in, in uh, Boston, uh, who will be talking about the immune therapies, uh, these very exciting new therapies, uh, uh, which are working uh, so well and uh, where we stand uh, with those therapies. So please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Raj. 
Um, thank, thank you, Brian. Um, what I will do over the next few minutes is obviously talk about immunotherapies, as Dr. Dury has uh, uh, alluded to, and really talk about how your own immune system is sort of uh, used to help with some of the treatments that we have available for us today. Here are my disclosures. And you know, harnessing the immune system is not something which is new to multiple myeloma. We all know that myeloma is an immune-based disease. And over the last 20 and 30 years, we've actually been working with the immune system to try and augment the immune system with some of the drugs that you're so familiar with, such as the monoclonal antibodies and some of the new, uh, the old immunomodulatory uh, drugs as well. What I will focus on in the next 20 minutes or so is talk to you about some of the new monoclonal antibodies. We're not going to spend a lot of time on isatuximab. This is the other CD38 monoclonal antibody, very similar to deratumumab. And if you've used deratumumab, isatuximab is just another CD38 monoclonal antibody which can be used. I will highlight some of the new immunomodulatory drugs. These are also referred to as cell mods, and we'll talk a little bit about iberdamide or CC220 and the new normal uh, cell mod, which is CC92480, which are also very effective. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about conjugated antibodies and obviously a lot of excitement around the bispecific T cell engagers as well as the cellular immunotherapies. So I want to get started by talking a little bit about precursor disease states and smoldering multiple myeloma. Uh, Dr. Dury has already highlighted this earlier on. And the biggest question here is, does the immune system see precursor lesions and does this recognition correlate with outcomes? Well, we all know that lenalidomide has been used in the context of smoldering multiple myeloma. We also know that the use of lenalidomide decreases the the risk of progression in specifically high-risk smoldering myeloma, which Dr. Jury has already alluded to. The problem with that approach, though, is that there are side effects to drugs like lenalidomide in patients who are otherwise completely asymptomatic in the smoldering multiple myeloma state. And because of those side effects, we do see discontinuation of lenalidomide. And as of right now, at least, we haven't seen an overall survival benefit. We've used a slightly different approach. We've talked a lot about vaccinations. Well, we've used vaccination approaches in smoldering multiple myeloma as well. And what we've done here is try to identify different peptides against which your body can in fact mount an immune response. And by doing so, we've come up with this tripeptide immune approach called PBX410, which is a vaccine. And we've used it with and without lenalidomide, as I was alluding to earlier on, lenalidomide is able to augment your immune responses to vaccination strategies. What we were able to show, this is a vaccine against three different proteins, XBP1, X, the splice form as well as the unspliced form, CS1 and CD138. And over time, as you get this vaccine, we are able to see vaccine-specific immune responses in patients. This is an ongoing trial in patients with multiple myeloma. The only limitation here is you have to be HLA-A2 restricted for this vaccine to be effective. <clears throat> What about some of the new cell uh, modulatory drugs, also called cell mods? Well, I told you we have two different ones, iberdamide and the more recent 480. This is even more potent than lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and it can, in fact, augment your immune response, as has been shown by upregulation of IL-2. This has been used in combination with dexamethasone, and then our ongoing trials in combination with some of the proteasome inhibitors, as well as the CD38 monoclonal antibodies. Suffice to say that when you look at CC480 now, you see an overall response rate of close to 55% at the recommended phase two dose. And this is in patients who have failed both lenalidomide and pomalidomide. So really an important advance in the future of taking care of people with uh, multiple myeloma who have failed some of the new uh, currently available immunomodulatory drugs. 
Obviously, the excitement, though, has been around BCMA. And just to get everybody on the same page here, BCMA stands for B-cell maturation antigen. It is a protein which is present on multiple myeloma cells. It belongs to the TNF family of uh, receptor proteins. And we know that BCMA is important in the survival of myeloma cells. There's a lot of different approaches of targeting BCMA. We're going to talk about some of these. We're going to talk about the BCMA ADC approach. We'll then talk about the BCMA CARS and BCMA bites as well. So we'll start off with the antibody drug conjugate. This is known as belantamab mafodotin. All of you are familiar with this known as Blenrep. This is a humanized antibody uh, against this BCMA protein, and it also has a toxin attached to it, which is called the MMAF. And this is the toxin which causes multiple myeloma cells to actually die. Now, this has been approved by the FDA based on this DREAM2 study design. This was a randomized study looking at two different doses of Blenrep. And when you look at these two different doses of Blenrep, it translated into an overall response rate of about 30% which translated into a progression-free survival of about three and a half months. But the duration of response was much longer than that. And this is something which we are using. One of the things to highlight here, though, is the ocular toxicity. Those of you who have seen Blenrep, you can end up with some eye toxicity, which is generally irritation in the eyes or blurry vision. So it's important when you get Blenrep that you get the ocular testing every so often. And we're doing studies to look at mitigation strategies of reducing this ocular toxicity in patients with multiple myeloma. What about the other interesting uh, uh, drug products which we are studying now in the context of myeloma? And these are known as bispecific antibodies. And what they do is this is a monoclonal antibody which targets this protein of interest, in our case, BCMA. And at the same time, in vivo, it can activate your T cells and bring those T cells close to the multiple myeloma cell and cause killing of the myeloma cell. One such example is CC93269, and as you can see in this figure, it is a bivalent antibody which binds to BCMA. Then you have that red piece in the middle there. This goes and activates your T cells. These are all joined together. So this is something which is really a huge advance in the context of myeloma, which is an off-the-shelf approach. And you can do what CAR T cells does that is bind your myeloma cells against BCMA and activate your T cells, bring them close to your myeloma cell and cause killing of your myeloma cells. With this, what we are seeing is absolutely remarkable response rates, close to 80 and 90% in terms of response rates once you get to the maximum tolerated dose or the recommended phase two dose of this drug. And really importantly, what we are seeing is stringent complete responses as well as very good partial responses, which are lasting as much as nine and 12 months in certain situations. There's another bispecific, there's a lot of bispecific antibodies which are in clinical trial development as we speak. Here's another example. This is uh, PF0686135. Uh, it's got a new name called l now. And this has also been tested in a phase one slash two study in this context, again, targeting BCMA. What you see here also is very high response rates in excess of 80%, where we're seeing minimal residual disease. And again, as with the previous bispecific T-cell engager, you are seeing responses which are long lasting going as much as a year as well. Now, obviously, there's a lot of enthusiasm with these bispecific T cell engagers because they are off the shelf. As you can see on this slide here, I've just highlighted the number of different clinical trials which are ongoing. And we hope that by the end of 2022, we'll have at least one or two of these bispecific T cell engagers approved in the context of multiple myeloma. 
as highlighted before, high response rates, no matter which bispecific T-cell engager you look at, anywhere between 60 to 80 percent. I think a little bit uh, to think about here is the toxicity, very similar to what we see with CAR T-cells. You see cytokine release syndrome. You do see neurotoxicity as well, specifically with dose one and dose two of these bispecific T-cell engagers. So it is important that they be given in the context of right now, certainly in the context of a clinical trial, but also at an academic institution which is familiar with managing neurotoxicity at CRS. I will say, though, that the CRS and neurotoxicity with bispecific specific T-cell engagers is a lot lower than with uh, uh, CAR T-cells. The difference with this, though, is these are weekly treatments or every other week treatment. So this is something which is continuous treatment in the context of multiple myeloma. Again, as you all are very familiar, we are all very excited with the chimeric antigen receptor uh, technology. We have our first CAR T-cell product, which is approved in the context of multiple myeloma. And we hope that we will have the second one approved later on this year as well. What CARs essentially are is we take your T-cells out and we gene genetically engineer these T-cells. One is by inserting the CAR receptor, and that's where the name comes from. And this CAR receptor is able to recognize different proteins. The ones which we have in clinical trials right now are mostly against BCMA, although the newer versions are looking at other CAR constructs as well. And then within the CAR construct, we then activate the T cells the way we do it with the bispecifics. And by doing so, these T cells then expand, go and find your myeloma cells and actually cause killing of your myeloma cells. Here's how CAR T cells are manufactured. You have to go through the process of leukapheresis. So you get onto a machine very similar to how stem cells are collected. But in this case, instead of stem cells, we're just collecting lymphocytes. So you do not have to get growth factor be before that, nor do you have to get any stem cell growth factor for uh, stem cells, but it's just lymphocytes. Once these lymphocytes are collected, we then have to do this engineering of these T cells, which takes anywhere between three and four weeks. And by the time we give these back to you, it's about a month or so. Before giving you back these T cells, we do give you a little bit of chemotherapy, which is referred to as lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and that is in general cytoxan and fludarabine. The one which is approved right now is either Captagene Beclusil, also known as a BECMA, for those of you who are familiar with this. This is the CAR T cell construct, which is against BCMA using 4-1-BB and cd 3 zeta as activation domains within. The way this uh, drug product got approved in the context of myeloma was with this pivotal phase two trial called the KARMA trial, which was really quite remarkable because 128 patients globally were treated. So not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. And what we saw with this is once you get to the recommended dose, which is 450 million cells, you get an overall response rate of 80% with this CAR T cell product. And this translates into a progression free survival of close to a year. Patients who actually achieve a complete response with this CAR T cell product had a median progression free survival of close to two years. There's another uh, drug product, CAR T cell product, which is in uh, clinical trial development. And our hope is that this is going to get approved very soon. This is referred to as Siltacel. The difference between Idacel and Siltacel is they're very similar. In fact, Siltacel is able to bind to two different epitopes of BCMA, as shown in this cartoon on your uh, slide. What this does is translates into a really nice, robust progression-free survival. The overall response rate with this is close to 97%. And on an average, and we haven't quite reached the median yet, at 22 months, you have, uh, that's where our progression-free survival is with this CAR T-cell product. 
Again, both Idacel and uh, Siltacel are very active uh, CAR T cell products. They're very similar in terms of toxicity of neurotoxicity and CRS. But along the last three and four years, I think we've become very familiar with this technology now. And we are pretty good at managing both CRS and neurotoxicity without any problems at all. Again, because of the excitement with CAR T cells, here are all the different CAR T cell products which are being tested in clinical trials as we speak. And we are very excited about the possibility of using this earlier on in the course of multiple myeloma care for our patients. Now, targeting BCMA is no longer a um, maybe a potential. You have two drug products, as I've already mentioned to you. We have bel um, belantamab, mafetotin, or Blenrep, and we also have the CAR T cell product, Idacel, which is approved. Our hope is that the bispecific T cell engagers will get approved shortly, hopefully by the end of next year. Obviously, there's subtle differences between the three, and I think one has to talk to your clinician and see which ones are the best suited for you during your course in the disease. Obviously, you know, we are not satisfied with what we've done with CAR T cells as yet, and we are wanting to try and do better. So we are, as we speak, studying in the laboratory of the different mechanisms of resistance. So what happens to you once you relapse post CAR T cells or post one of these BCMA directed strategies? How can we begin to start thinking about you? And we have different ways and approaches by studying the mechanisms of resistance of these treatment uh, 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 modalities. One example of such a modality is BB21217. This is a CAR T cell product which is uh, being produced in the context of a PI3 kinase inhibitor. And by doing so, we are creating a more of a memory T cell phenotype. And by doing so, we are ending up with a more potent and more um, sustained response with some of these CAR T cell uh, products. Uh, so in general, I think our current understanding is certainly BCMA is a really promising uh, target. I've shown you data with uh, antibody drug conjugates with the T cell engagers as well as cellular products all of them are showing very, very high efficacy uh, and pretty high durability as well. We do know we need to do better. And I think in the future, we are going to begin to understand how we can begin to combine some of these and sequence some of these. And we are already looking at the next generation of approaches. And I've shown you one example of this, which was uh, BB21217. With that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nooper, for that excellent uh, presentation, summarizing these, as you emphasized several times, really exciting uh, new data. And, and just to say that the results in the patient's treaty so far in the relapse setting are, are really triggering the idea that we will increasingly be using those exciting uh, approaches uh, earlier and earlier in the disease, especially for patients with uh, high risk or earlier relapse, uh, these types of situations. Uh, but talking about uh, relapse, uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, back to our, our series here, um, uh, Dr. Rafat Abinar from uh, Indiana, and uh, uh, he will talk about uh, relapse and some of the other types of uh, relapse therapies that are available uh, in 2021. So please welcome uh, Dr. Abinar. So uh, right. again, thank you for inviting. Yes, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you about uh, relapse multiple myeloma. I look forward to the day that we can meet in person again. So hopefully, more people get vaccinated so we can end up uh, in the mutations. Uh, of this virus and hopefully we can get together again. So uh, when should we treat a relapse disease? Do we treat the patient when they have biochemical relapse? That means the myeloma proteins start rising or the free light chain start going up? Or do we treat that clinical relapse when they start having symptoms related to the disease, anemia, kidney damage, 
high calcium or new bone lesions? Or do we treat when they have extra majority disease? We call that plasmacytomas. And, you know, they, we don't know, but we can speculate when to treat because most of the approved treatment today, <clears throat> excuse me, for relapse multiple myeloma is really done at biochemical relapse. And some observation does support better outcome when treating biochemical relapse. So if you look at one study from Mayo Clinic, looking at overall survival, the uh, median was uh, 125 months versus 81 months if you treat at biochemical relapse versus symptomatic relapse. So early intervention may be useful. So, but there are cons and you know uh, pros for uh, each approach and. Treating at biochemical relapse, about 25% of the patient will have a smoldering course, and they don't progress for at least two years. So you may be treating, you know, um, a lot of patients, uh, and a quarter of them may just behave like any other smoldering myeloma, and probably prior presentation, if somebody smoldered in the past for a while and you treated them, and now they're relapsing, you can probably be patient for a couple of months to see what is the tempo of the relapse. But the pros against this approach is that most of the studies suggest that the time between biochemical relapse and clinical symptoms related to myeloma is about five to six months. So, and data, you know, uh, it suggests that if you don't get it right at the first relapse, you may not get it right at subsequent relapse. And this may be changing but you can see with each line of therapy, the sort of duration of response is shorter. So you get, you know, uh, duration of response was now in good induction treatment, maybe four years, as you heard. And the second is maybe three years. And with each third in line of therapy, that number keeps going down. So I think uh, getting it right early on is very important. The other concept in approaching relapse patient is that when you relapse, you are relapsing with a disease that is not uniform. And uh, we call that clonal heterogeneity. And especially with each relapse, you will get a different sort of subpopulation of the, your myeloma, your cancer sort of uh, taking over. So if you really want to get rid of myeloma and get rid of myeloma for good, you want a therapy that sort of attack all different clones. So say that in English, I mean, I think it's myeloma cells and each patient of, is like a family of odds and aggressive members. So the longer they stick around, the odder and the more aggressive they become. And family therapy is not going to work. You have to uh, really make the case for treating them early and with combination therapy. So what are the factors that influence the choice of therapy at relapse? Well, there are three areas. One is disease-related, one is prior regimen-related, and one patient-related. So if you look at a uh, disease-related factor, you know, what is the feature of relapse? Are they just having symptoms, uh, you know, such high calcium, renal failure, anemia? You have to address that quickly and fast. If you have extra majority disease, that's an aggressive disease. You have to uh, come up with a combination that known to work in that population. Patients who have high-risk cytogenetics tend to be aggressive. Again, you need to address sort of the disease uh, nature uh, initially or, and at relapse. So regimen-related, you know, um, so always the question is that do you repeat the same regimen you had before? And I think it can be, but you have to look at what was the previous treatment, the dose, the duration of the treatment, what were the side effects? How did the patient tolerate the prior treatment? Any residual side effect that may influence the choice of new therapy. If you have significant neuropathy, you don't want to use a drug that affects that. If you have renal impairment, you have to be careful choosing the right drug. And you know, depth of duration of previous treatment is also important. If you just get a partial response from the first treatment, why would repeat that? I mean, you want to use more combination that are quite you know, known to produce a deeper response. And I think patient-related factor also very important. You know, performance status and how frail is the patient is important. 
uh, other comorbidity, we talked about diabetes and neuropathy, renal failure, heart failure, those can influence what we do. Uh, is, a transplant uh, is the patient transplant eligible or not? Because sometimes we use a second transplant. And, you know, we have to listen to the patient. And uh, some patients have difficulty coming to the clinic every week uh, or three times a month, whatever. So uh, we need to listen to the patient. Obviously, sometimes uh, costs and socio uh, so socioeconomics influence also the choice of the salvage treatment. So um, you heard about a lot of things today. What's currently available for um, you know antimyeloma therapy, and you know obviously we have the steroids, the conventional sort of chemotherapy, uh, and then you have the emits, the proteasome inhibitor, the new uh, immunologic approach, and then the XPO inhibitor. And um, so obviously we don't have all day to talk about all of these but I'm gonna highlight some examples of these uh, drugs and how they work and maybe talk about some of pros and cons of some of these approaches. Obviously, if I have my choice, I will take some of these medication off this list, but I'm trying to be in uh, inclusive. So how does your doctor decide what to do? Like going to a, a Greek restaurant and trying to figure out what dish to order. It's a very complicated menu. And believe it or not, the doctors go by this called NCCN guideline, the National Cancer Center Network. And if you look at this guideline for relapse patient, and this probably been updated since I uh, took that slide from the website, and you can see how complicated it is. You know, I think, you know, the good news is that we have options. The bad news, your doctor may not, may get confused because obviously, you know, what do I do when my patients for a relapse? But I think the principle is really, you know, uh, knowing what the patient's condition is, prior therapy, and, you know, uh, and choose one of these options here. So the similar approach is really the Mayo Clinic approach where they say, okay, this is what you do at first relapse. And you can see, for example, if somebody was on maintenance lenalidomide and they have a relapse and they fit, you can consider a carfilzomib pomelomide based regimen or daratumumab or tazomib based regimen. Uh, if they have indolent relapse, you know, you may not need to be that aggressive and you can consider exazomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. If a uh, patient was not on maintenance, you know, again, you can consider carfilzomib, kyprolis, lenalidomide, dexamethasone or dara, uh, rebelmid, dexamethasone. But if the patient indolent and frail, you can do an oral regimen like exazomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. And this is for second relapse. And, you know, my idea is that I think, you know, what, you know, you use what is really, you know, known to be very effective. And there are a lot of options here. So the emits change from lenalidomide to pomelomide. And uh, you get then options of monoclonal antibody or carfilzomib in the relapse setting. And uh, so a lot of good option there. So I'm just gonna highlight some trials that showed really combination is better. So this trial is uh, uh, called the POLAX trial. And it was looking at, in the relapse setting in the old day, we did two drugs like lenalidomide dexamethasone. So that was the control arm. The uh, treatment, uh, I mean, the study arm was the deratumumab plus lenalidomide dexamethasone, so DRD versus RD. It was a randomized study. Uh, so what happened there? Well, I think what happened is that the uh, patient who received the combination therapy actually did better than the people who just received two drugs in terms of you know, staying free of uh, relapse or symptoms related to the disease. Uh, at three months follow-up was 58% versus 35%. So there was significant improvement uh, in uh, the what we call PFS. And, you know, sometimes you say, if you have an early relapse, less than 12 months of last treatment, you may actually not do as well. So they did this analysis based on patient who had an early relapse versus late relapse. And as you can see, both uh, group benefited from the combination therapy. So again, that makes the case that combination therapy, either for earlier relapse 
or late relapse is benefiting the patient, providing them a better control of their disease for the longest time possible. Again, uh, uh, there's another monoclonal antibody that has been studied, isatuximab, and approved by the FDA uh, in combination with either pomilomide dexamethasone or carfilzomib kyprolis. And both trials showed that the triplet regimen is better than the doublet. So combination of three drugs is better than two drugs. So you heard from my colleague, Dr. Rai, about uh, monoclonal antibody, and I'm not gonna repeat, but uh, you know that uh, antibody therapy can be uh, you know, different. One of them, you just, you know, we talked about the naked antibody, both uh, deratumumab and isatuximab, but these are more sophisticated antibody. One will have a conjugate that, you know, it's like a bomb hooked to an antibody that uh, when it gets inside the cells, destroy the cells. And then you can bring the immune cells next to the um, myeloma cells. So these are the bispecific antibody, and then that can destroy the disease. And so the, the, I think that right now what we have approved is a column uh, uh, in the left and in the, in the right. The middle one is not yet approved, the bispecific antibodies, but I doubt that, uh, you know, maybe next year we'll see one of them approved. And so what are the pros and cons of these um, sort of approach? CAR T cells is, uh, you know, it's a, you have to produce these cells. So you have to be able to get enough T cells from the patient. You have to send them for manufacturing. And so obviously that time, it takes time, four to six weeks. And now because there's a lot of demand, we're not getting enough slots to get CAR T cells produced. So the patient has to, you know, uh, have their disease under control. And, you know, when you have really seen a lot of lines of therapy, it is very hard to wait four to six weeks. Uh, but the bispecific antibody and the antibody conjugates are off the shelf. You know, they're available. It's like any other drugs. Um, all, uh, you know, but each has different side effects, you know, and uh, I'll highlight some of them here shortly. So, why BCMA? That's the actually the target that everybody is liking. So whether it's a conjugated antibody, bispecific antibody, CAR T cells, all trying to attack that BCMA. So BCMA, as you can see, is sort of present on the plasma cells. That's these the cells that become myeloma cells, and actually the also the kind of couple cells prior to these plasma cells that they are about to become plasma cells. So it's a great target because it's present on plasma cells and specifically on myeloma cells. Um, and it's not present, for example, on early B cells, you know? So when somebody gets a treatment that kills B cells, which doesn't happen in myeloma, it happens in lymphoma, their immune system is suppressed for eight to nine months. But if you kill these plasma cells and you stop the treatment, uh, this immune response recovered quickly. So that's one thing about BCMA antibodies. Uh, the other thing is BCMA is sort of control the proliferation of the cells. So if you block it, you, the cells undergo uh, death. So it's a great target. And that's why you're seeing great results with all these different studies. And you heard from my uh, colleague, Dr. Raj, about uh, the drug that it's approved, the conjugated antibody that works in different ways. You know, it just binds to the myeloma cells and bring the immune cells to kill it. Uh, deliver this uh, uh, mephidotin, which goes inside the cells and, and kills the cells. And, you know, um, it's a great drug. But I just want to remind you that all drugs that are approved in the relapse setting are right now approved as a single agent. So it's not a combination therapy. And when they approve as a single agent, if you look at most of the study, except for the CAR T cells, the overall response rate is about 30 to 40%. So it makes sense that we really need to move uh, these clinical trials that use combination of such a drug with other drugs like, you know, the emets, the pomelomide, or carfilzomib, kyprolis, uh, quickly, because I think that's where we will improve the outcome of patients who are now in their third or fourth relapse. So I'm excited about these drugs, but obviously, we cannot depend on them as a single Asian drug. They need to be used in combination and the trials need to be completed quickly. 
and you uh, and that's the you know so you heard about the overall response rate in this tri in this trial, and you heard about the uh, ocular toxicity. We don't know what really caused it, but it basically the cornea, the lining of the outline uh, outside of your uh, eye is get damaged, and that's why you need to have an eye exam before you start and before each dosing, so you can make sure that you are safe enough to get this next dose. And then uh, this drug, um, uh, Melfufen, uh, was approved also um, in the management of patients with multiple myeloma. And uh, these were refractory patients. And um, it looks like as a single agent, first of all, why is it exciting drugs? I guess because it really needs to go inside the myeloma cells and a specific uh, enzyme will break this uh, drug into its active form and sort of maybe cause more damage to the myeloma cells than other uh, cells. And I think, you know, again, the response rate is about, you know, 30%, uh, and if you break it to different group, we maybe go up to 50%. So it's an available options for patients with multiple myeloma. There's, uh, you know, um, right now, because of uh, certain finding on combination studies, uh, the drug is approved for patients. However, the combination trials are on hold until uh, make sure that uh, they understand some of the side effects that have been reported. So I think this is my summary slide, is that uh, not all relapses are the same. Uh, so some relapses are mild, you know, um, indolent, and you can watch the patients. You know, you don't make a decision based on first numbers you see, at least repeat it if it's not in two weeks, four weeks, and see what's going on with the patient. Uh, you know, do stage him well, check the bone marrow, check the PET scan maybe, and, and make a decision based on that. And again, the combination therapy is very important. I don't think we can hit a home run with one or two drugs. I mean, the combination therapy for relapse patient makes sense. And then... I, I think, you know, the good news is that, you know, um, some of us on this talk have been doing myeloma for, you know, a long time, some much longer than others. Uh, and now we have great options. We used to say at the relapse setting, we have one or two drugs. Now we have 13 drugs or more and more are coming. So I think this is really great. And I think the optimal therapy for relapse patient is based on the patient needs, you know their disease needs, their socioeconomic needs, their social needs. We can't just say one size fit all. I mean, I think the good news is that, you know, we can honor the patient wishes. And, you know, the goal is, you know, not to live for myeloma, but to try to live with myeloma. So they have, you know, patient wants to travel, patient wants to work. You know, we need to find a way to make that possible. And I think it's really good idea to try to get the response um, right at first relapse, because with each relapse, your chances of getting it right is reduced. So with that, I'll be happy to join the panel discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Rafat. Uh, really uh, excellent uh, overview of, of, of the approach to relapse, uh, biochemical relapse, clinical relapse, and, uh, and the options uh, to consider. Um, uh, perhaps I can start, uh, I, I, as we often do, we have, uh, questions from, uh, Jack Aiello and he actually, he <laughs> has, uh, three questions for you, uh, starting straight out the gate here. So, so maybe, um, I'll, I'll go through Jack's question. So the first question that he asked, question 204 is, um, in the relapse setting, uh, you've highlighted, you know, all the different options. When you were looking at are all the different options, are there any that you prefer perhaps not to have at the top of your list uh, when, when you're prioritizing your choices? D do you care to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted me to get into trouble. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to avoid the, uh, you know, straight answer, but I really think it's very important to look at you know, uh, the prior history, the type of relapse, what the patients want, and what is the side effect profile of the drugs available 
to the patients because you you know the good news is that you have options for the patients so you can afford avoid certain unpleasant side effect and things like that but sometimes you really have no choice and you use whatever available but i i think i will have a good discussion with the patients i will tell them about the combination therapy and i will say this combinations works really well and uh you know sometimes we use drugs that not fda approved yet oh. for example i mean i have a patient who had uh multiple relapses was on a clinical trial with a bicma uh you know the car t cells relapse was in six months and here's a translocation 1114 so we offered them carfilzomib and the vinetoclax and this guy is now seven months out in remission so you know we try to do the right things for the patient based on the science and understanding of the disease characteristic and the side sounds effect good, sounds good so so the, so so the second question i think is very reasonable so um right now we talk about in the frontline setting uh, a top regimen would be dara revlimid belkid and dex so in the in the relapse setting probably an excellent uh, combination to consider would be to substitute pomalidomide for Rev and Kyprolis for Valcade, uh, or maybe even think about uh, ISA for Dara. Uh, so, so is that a helpful way to look at having a strong uh, combination in the relapse setting? I think that's a very reasonable, good option. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Jack, you, you, you get a thumbs <laughs> up on that one, apparently. <laughs> uh, and then um, what about transplants? Uh, we've been talking about how since the frontline therapies are getting uh, better and better, especially with uh, quadruplets, if you take Dara, Revdex, or Dara, KRD, whatever, uh, you might defer transplant. So what about the use of transplants uh, in the relapse or what we call salvage uh, setting? There's a lot of data on that uh, and suggests that it can be an effective way to reestablish control of the disease, improve the blood counts. Clearly, uh, you know, those kind of transplant, they can be short lived unless you come up with a creative maintenance therapy based on the patient condition. But I think that option continue to be valuable, maybe benefit, you know, 30, 40 percent of the patients. Um, uh, but the most important thing is that uh, do it at the right time and also uh, do the right uh, maintenance setting. I don't know what you do, uh, Dr. Raj. Oh, I think uh, very, very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I agree completely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the good news is we have lots of different options and as has been highlighted, I don't think it's one size fits all. I think uh, uh, considering a transplant at the time of relapse is important. And I think uh, one of the most important things to sort of keep in the back of our minds when we have all of these options is uh, don't burn bridges, have all available options yes. uh, to you. And that's no sort bridges. of the discussion right. I have with all my patients. Right. There, there, there is a question here, uh, Nupur, which I think uh, might uh, be personally important for you. It's a, it's a question about whether um, if someone has uh, actually developed uh, COVID, um, should they later go ahead and uh, get uh, the vaccination? Yeah, uh, the, good question. Uh, so I had COVID, as all of you know, but uh, I did get the vaccine. I think you have to consider your vaccine as the booster to the booster. <laughs> so I would get the vaccine. <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, I don't know if you had any side effects, but um, uh, you're probably aware of these data where the, the long haul symptoms, some of these really troublesome things, uh, you know, neurologic and fatigue and different things, uh, about half the patients who had those types of long haul features uh, actually got better with the vaccination. Uh, you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, yeah, no, we've uh, seen this with patients. So, uh, you know, personally, I did not have any um, uh, symptoms to begin with with COVID, and I didn't. I did have symptoms with the second, the booster dose of the vaccine, oh, as I with see. most people. Uh, but again, long haul symptoms, I don't think so. At least I don't think so. But yeah, no, we've heard of those, and um, there is some data to show that the vaccination actually helps with some of those long haul symptoms. Right, 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 right. Another uh, kind of related question, which I think is quite important, and I've, I've had some experience with, with this, uh, if a myeloma patient does develop uh, a COVID positive and develops early symptoms, uh, how should they be managed? Uh, and uh, my strategy on that has been uh, with, with the data that we have is actually to bring them into the hospital and give them uh, uh, the, the antibody therapy uh, with, for example, the Regeneron uh, product. I, I think um, my feeling is that's probably a good idea to intervene in kind of an early proactive <laughs> way with that if a myeloma patient does test uh, COVID positive. Uh, uh, could, maybe you can comment on that, maybe Rafat as well. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, uh, you know, so uh, again, go by the guidance of your institutions. So we've had a few uh, myeloma patients who've not required hospitalization because they had mild symptoms and we treated them at home. There were others who we hospitalized and at least at our institution, if you're oxygen requiring, you end up getting remdesivir, uh, the monoclonal antibody cocktail uh, which Dr. Jury is mentioning is more an outpatient approach, which we did use in a subset of patients who did not need hospitalization. But I would really go by uh, what is what is the being considered at your institution and what your guidelines at that institution are. I agree. Do you recommend that patients use a pulse oximeter, or, oximeter or, or uh, have a an Apple Watch where they can follow their oxygen level? So we've done that, and what we've had out here, um, Brian, is you know early days last year. We well, Boston obviously was in a lot of trouble, uh, but we created uh, in our cancer center a system called the RAX system, which is a, a respiratory uh, sort of screening system. And if you have symptoms of cough, cold, etc., we actually do see you. We monitor, we test you, and we then uh, triage you. If you're triaging you home, then absolutely we have a home uh, kind of monitoring system, which includes using uh, these remote monitoring devices for your oxygen saturations, your temperature, and essentially how you're feeling, and we keep in close contact with you. Um, and if you need hospitalization, obviously all of that is done in-house. Right, right, right. So, so um, Rafat, any uh, comments on this topic? No, no. Uh, I just want to bring an issue that I saw questions um, that yeah. people are staying on dexamethasone for a long time. Right. And, uh, I'm, you know, I think once the disease is under control and you're almost in remission or you just have a little disease, I think one need to discuss the steroids long term was their uh, physician because I think data suggests that longer uh, exposure to steroids does not really improve the outcome, but may actually impair your immune response. Right. Yeah, I think a very good uh, point. And uh, maybe a link to that. Uh, someone asks here, um, when we when we were saying uh, do not burn bridges, uh, someone wants to know, well, what exactly does that mean? Uh, when we say that. So, you know, I'll, I'll take that because I said that, uh, Brian. So a few things I think it's really important to remember. Uh, you know, if you choose not to get a transplant up front, which is perfectly reasonable, don't stay on an image indefinitely because that's going to interfere with your stem cell collection. So have those stem cells collected and stored, which you may or may not use later on. The other thing is think about if you're using, now that we have all of these BCMA-directed strategies, it's really important to try and figure out which BCMA-directed strategy you uh, want, because especially on a clinical trial, you know, before all of these are approved, they... 
if you get a prior BCMA, you get excluded from a specific clinical trial. So I think talking to your physician, and if your physician is not a necessarily somebody who does myeloma all the time, uh, touching base with somebody who has that myeloma expertise, who can sort of walk you through these different options, I think is a good idea. Yes, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Yes. Um, still more questions about COVID. Um, uh, and uh, Rafat, you answered one of the questions on this. Um, uh, do we have any indication that uh, uh, if you get the vaccine, uh, and then now we're recommending that patients would get like three doses, that, that there's any indication that this could uh, trigger myeloma? And this is a concern, not just for patients with myeloma, but maybe yeah. patients with motoring myeloma or something like that. But to my knowledge, we really haven't seen any actual triggering of the myeloma. Would that be correct? In no, no. I, I, think I, it. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I Kevin, think Kevin, you can chime in on this as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're checking the free light chain, you know, sort of immediately after you get the vaccine, it may be, you know, slightly elevated, you know, in the next, uh, you know, two to four weeks after the vaccine. But if, you know, it does come back down to, you know, normal, the following test. So I really don't react to a, uh, you know, patient who get vaccinated and the light chain goes up just one reading, you know, because, you know, it's just uh, you're stimulating the immune system and you're stimulating any plasma cells. So you may get a little rise, but it does not really cause sort of, reason for relapse of the disease does not do that right 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 yeah i haven't seen a relapse uh, uh, nuper or, or kevin have you seen patients where there's been a concern of a new disease i, I haven't really heard of that at all I have uh, the, not. the light chain things uh, uh, a number of patients have commented on that Right. I have not seen that, but uh, in, in the same respect, you will, I always tell patients we don't put any value, uh, like Dr. Robin and I were saying, we don't put any value in two numbers. You can't draw a straight line between two numbers. You need a couple right. of, a couple of uh, uh, data points to make any anything out of this. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, don't be afraid of the vaccination. I think it saves lives. It's going to save, uh, even if you end up with COVID post-vaccination, that COVID is going to be milder. So we haven't seen any data suggest that uh, the vaccination in itself uh, causes myeloma. There's data which has come out from the Greeks, which have looked at the incidence of myeloma pre-COVID and during COVID, and really there is no difference in the incidence pre and post. All right, very, very good. And um, yeah, so so one other thing, just a small point is that uh, in, in the scheme of things, uh, we've also been looking at um, MGUS uh, versus smoldering and active myeloma. And uh, it seems that uh, uh, patients with MGUS are really not at particular risk uh, related to COVID as compared to uh, other people of the same age and other medical status. So that uh, I think uh, good news is that if you have MGUS, uh, really that doesn't confer uh, a high risk uh, or, or risk of problems that we do see with, with myeloma, just, just a comment. And they um, develop an immune response too, to the vaccine. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent response. Yeah. Very, very good. Important. To, yes, definitely. Uh, there's a question about uh, CRISPR, CRISPR, which is a, a technique for um, DNA uh, editing. Uh, this is something for the future, certainly something that can be used to help generate more tailored uh, vaccines. And I think it may be used for, for that in the future with mRNA. Uh, we're also looking at um, uh, CRISPR technology in our studies in, uh, in Iceland. Uh, in Iceland, we're looking at uh, uh, populations who are at risk uh, of getting MGUS and at risk for progression. And then there could be an option for uh, CRISPR gene editing technologies there. But this, this, is, this is for the future, but it's definitely probably going to be an important technology. Uh, then, uh, let's see, uh, one just practical point, which I think is a good idea. Someone says, well, how about making sure that, um, uh, family members, caregivers, and those that you are routinely in contact with 
get vaccinated well also. And I think that this is obviously a very good idea to encourage family members, caregivers and friends uh, to be vaccinated to help protect the group that you will be with uh, mostly in your uh, lo local uh, activities. <clears throat> And I encourage the family not to be with somebody in the family who's not vaccinated without a mask on and try Absolutely. to avoid them. I mean, I have a patient uh, who had COVID uh, in, the, uh, in the spring and come back. You know, he was in Florida, came back to Indiana and his grandson does not want to get vaccinated. And, you know, the grandma and the patient are frustrated, you know, and they said, well, don't be around him. And maybe grandma can yell at him because he will listen to grandma and get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that you do need to take a tough approach on that and, and really uh, either not get together with them or really be firm about the need for, for protection. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so uh, we don't have questions on this, uh, but, uh, but Nooper, I don't know whether you want to talk about it specifically, but um, I think that... Um, uh, here in 2021, heading into 2022, uh, um, we, we may have some uh, cautions about some of these immune therapies, uh, uh, maybe maybe even the, the CAR T therapies, where we, we may have some cautions related to, to COVID and, and might have some, some special recommendations uh, for, for maybe boosters or something like that to make sure for, for patients getting those more aggressive immune therapies are, are well protected. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Or maybe you don't want to comment. <laughs> Did we lose uh, maybe maybe uh, Nooper has left us for now. <laughs> hmm? Oh, she's gone? She had to drop. Oh. Oh, we're... Um, Okay, uh, so so Rafat, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Uh, I feel like we should we need to have a degree of caution. I said again, what the well, just just uh, when we're using CAR T therapies or maybe a quadruple yeah. with Dara or ISA, you know mm -hmm. that we might want to be a little bit more cautious. Yeah, no, I think you know, obviously monitoring the patient especially after any bcma therapy you know using monoclonal antibody you need to make also paying attention to their normal igg because these patients they become hypogammaglobulinemic they become immune deficient and right. they will probably need to get an intravenous immunoglobulin so i th right. you know i think we should not underestimate that you know i love plasma cells i love them when they make good antibodies. I hate them when they, you know, become malignant, but we should right. not ignore that normal plasma cells. That's why we live 80, 90 years. We need them. So we need to respect them. We need to find a way to protect the normal plasma cells. And if they're not working, how can we, you know, sort of right. uh, generate a, a response similar to normal? Right. Absolutely. Along the same lines, there was a question uh, about getting other kinds of vaccinations right now. And, and my suggestion is for the next two or three months, if you're getting your booster, et cetera, I wouldn't take any other vaccinations uh, right at the minute. So to try to enhance uh, the, the, the COVID antibody response. Uh, actually, there's another um, question from Jack, which I think is a good one, and maybe we can all answer it. Uh, it, it you know, I think we all really do want desperately to get back to face-to-face -to -face me meetings. Uh, however, uh, especially with this Delta variant, uh, I and and the fact that even people who are fully vaccinated can get infected and can even transmit the infection, uh, I am quite cautious about resuming face-to-face -face, uh, meetings, uh, and so. Uh, we're not rushing uh, to do that uh, even through the end of this year. Um, so, Rafat and, and Kevin, uh, what, what what feedback are you getting on that? Yeah, our our local support group here is is still not doing face to face meetings. They, they are um, doing them. They are not doing them. Excuse me. No, not. they're not doing them. No, no, no. And and Rafat, I mean, I think that we're looking at yeah, no we... face to face meetings probably for the balance of the next several months probably yeah. for a while. 
that's what I think. Yeah, just, we were thinking just, about having a picnic, you know, a family picnic for all of my Aloma patients here in Indiana. But uh, we are probably not going to be able to do it because of the recent spike in the number of cases. Right, right. Well, we just don't want to be putting people at risk. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I wear my mask everywhere I go. I'm vaccinated. I, you know, I, right. you know, in Indiana, you don't have to wear a mask when you go places, but I'm not going to take a chance. I'm no, going to no, wear my uh, mask and I'm not going to sit no, with uh, anybody I don't know without a mask. No, no, I wear my, I wear my mask wherever I go. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, well, I think that we, we have really covered a lot of ground. Uh, there are some questions. Uh, uh, I don't know. I can, I can touch on just a couple that are uh, just small. Someone wanted to know if they should take contrast if they're getting an MRI and they have kidney problems. We don't need to use contrast with MRI anymore. So uh, don't, don't take contrast when you're getting an MRI done. Uh, we can analyze the MRI without using a contrast. And then a lady was wondering whether she needed to delay her mammogram right now uh, if she's going to get a COVID vaccine. Uh, it, it's probably safe enough. I mean, I think that um, it, it might be good uh, to, depending on, the, uh, I know that some no, no, Let me ask you this, uh, Brian. The reason yeah. for that is that when the, you get a shot in your arm, you may get a swollen lymph node in the armpit. Right. So when they do right. the uh, ultrasound, they may find a, a, and then they go crazy and they do right. all the stuff and they may biopsy it. So right. I will definitely wait on the mammogram for a couple months. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. So get the, or get the mammogram uh, first and then first get the, and then get oh, the it, vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. And then uh, I think that, that's probably, um, oh, uh, one last thing, I guess, um, uh, which I guess is important. A gentleman is asking if, uh, if he's had autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, he was vaccinated before the transplant, but probably he should go ahead and get vaccinated again after the transplant. And Rafat, you mentioned uh, that possibly we could do that a little sooner than the 100 day point, maybe after two, yeah. three months, go ahead and get revaccinated just as we do for other vaccines, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, well, uh, thanks to everyone for participating. Thanks uh, particularly to Rafat, uh, Kevin, and Nupur for giving our, uh, our guests uh, really expert uh, presentations, uh, bringing everyone uh, up to speed. And uh, thank you to everyone for excellent questions, which which actually help everyone learn as we try to give answers as best we uh, can. Uh, and so uh, uh, appreciate this. Uh, this is uh, a webinar where we will appreciate your feedback. Uh, uh, we always want to know uh, what else would help to make this uh, worthwhile and, and the best that it can be. And um, uh, the only other closing remarks is that we again uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, the first time around, I did not mention Carrier Forum, which uh, for some reason I missed it among all of the others, uh, but we definitely uh, appreciate the support from all of our sponsors uh, and, and those are, are all of the others that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation today. So I think that with that, uh, we Thank will you. close for this Saturday, and uh, thanks, thanks to everyone. And uh, have a good weekend. Thank, thanks for having us. Thank yeah, you for everyone. joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Uh, enjoy Bye. the rest of your weekend.